Welcome. I'm Karen Lawrence, president of the Huntington. During her illustrious and consequential career, Carol Christ has championed the importance of accessible higher education in the liberal arts and sciences, women's issues and diversity, as well as fostering campus community. She's led crucial capital projects, literally building foundations for future generations of faculty and students. She'll be retiring from the chancellorship in June. Beyond what you see on the page, I've had the personal pleasure of a friendship with Carol Christ for over 35 years. We first met in a hotel room at a Modern Language Association meeting. The MLA, Modern Language Association, is the largest professional organization in the US for scholars of languages and literature. The chair of the Department of English at the University of Virginia, a woman named Pat Spax, got the idea to invite all the women chairs of university English departments to get together at MLA. All six of us assembled <laughs> in her very small hotel room. I can't remember the city. And that's how our friendship began. Since then, Carol has been a great advisor, including as a trustee of Sarah Lawrence College, where for 10 years I was president. We also have in common that we spent our childhoods going to public school in Bergen County, New Jersey. <laughs> so before we begin, I know that you all received question cards, or you should have when you came in. And as you're listening, please feel free to jot down questions. They will be collected as we're nearing our, the end of our discussion, and uh, Raylene Galarza will hand them to me, and I look forward to having Carol <laughs> and us uh, address them as many as we can. So please now join me in welcoming Carol Christ to the stage. Okay, welcome. It is well, wonderful. thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, and it's a pleasure to spend more time with you. Thank you. And earlier, our wonderful library curators showed Carol some treasures in our library of Victorian poetry, Tennyson, Rossetti, um, Browning. Yes. Was, yeah, yeah, it was wonderful, as well as some um, uh, uh, forgeries of those yes. poets. I didn't know <laughs> it was true. worth forging those poets, but That's it is. That's true. I left out the four. We do have forgeries, but we label them, just so you know. Just in case you're coming to do research, they're, they're, clearly, they're clearly identified. Um, OK, so I would like to begin by saying you've had an incredible academic career. And when you finished, uh, completed your presidency at Smith uh, after 11 years, I remember you telling me that you were, look forward, you were looking forward to returning to Berkeley and to taking a half-time appointment <laughs> as, as the director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education. So my first question is, what happened to those plans once you got back to Berkeley? Because it certainly doesn't seem like you have a half-time appointment now. Well, I clearly flunked retirement. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I, what happened is the provost at Berkeley resigned very suddenly. His wife became very ill. And I was asked to be the interim provost for a year. And uh, it, during that year, there was a search for a new chancellor, and many people have encouraged me to throw my hat in the ring. And after great reluctance, I finally did, and the rest is history. Okay. So you flunked retirement. Yes. I, I kind of did that. But I intend to pass it the next course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you started in two, July 2017, you're the 11th chancellor and the first woman chancellor. And there had... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, and there was a leadership crisis right. at the time and free speech controversies. So if you, we could start by, we're gonna talk about free speech tonight, um, but would you talk about that first year and, uh, and how you dealt with it and was there anything that prepared you uh, for that, but, but really about that first year? Yeah, oh, I certainly will talk about that first year. So the, the um, semester before I began, Milo Sianopoulos, who's a kind of right-wing provocateur, uh, came to campus to speak. There was a riot on Sproul Plaza, a fire, lots of um, damage done, and, um, and he obviously couldn't speak. The speech was canceled and he and the, uh, was evacuated for his own safety. And one of the things that I observed in thinking not only about that event, but the aftermath of it, was that it was a huge reputational damage to Berkeley for a conservative speaker not to be able to speak on campus. So I was determined when I became chancellor that uh, conservative speakers would be able to speak on campus. Uh, the first conservative speaker that we hosted was a man named Ben Shapiro. We brought in a huge yeah. security forces to enable him to speak, and indeed, he did um, speak and left successfully. Um, <laughs> and, then, um, and then Milo Yiannopoulos decided he wanted to come back for what he called a free speech week which were going to be five days, oh five God. days isn't quite a week, of, um, of, of four events a day. And he had a huge lineup of speakers um, uh, uh, for, uh, for this event. And it was, we were really trying to prepare really carefully. But then as the days got closer and closer, some very strange things started to happen. First of all, the student group that was sponsoring this, these talks, this free speech week, hadn't signed any of the contracts for the rooms and hadn't put any of the deposits down. We thought this was strange. Then Milo Sianopoulos published on his website the list of all the speakers who were going to come, and we started getting these calls saying, my, list, my name is on this list, but I've never heard of this event. Oh, God. So this was really curious. So, uh, we decided we were going to play a game of chicken. <laughs> and, um, and my, my um, hunch, which turned out to be right, is that Milo Yiannopoulos didn't really want to put on this event. In fact, he hadn't really prepared to put on this event. He wanted us to cancel the event. So we did not cancel the event. And <laughs> uh, the day before, he pulled out. Um, so what was really interesting to me about this was it seemed to me to suggest two different kinds of events. Ben Shapiro wanted to come to an auditorium like this. He wanted to speak. He wanted to have an audience hear him. Milo Yiannopoulos had no such intention. What he wanted to do was create a um, social media splash about Berkeley not allowing him to speak. And by calling his bluff, we great. succeeded. Now, the campus was very upset at the police presence that we used. And so what I did was created a free speech commission in which we had weeks upon weeks of hearings about free speech and came to some conclusions about it that were, I think, helpful conclusions. I wish they were serving us better in right this now. year, but one of the really interesting things about institutions of higher education is the student population changes every four years. So even if those students in 2017 and 2018 absorbed the campus dialogue, the students yeah. in 2024 um, are, are strangers to it, and so th there, there are some things you have to keep repeating <laughs> in the academy, and the current crisis, I think, is very, very different from the crisis that well, we let had Let me go back to that, but I'm curious, were there student organizations who had sponsored yes. him? Oh, okay, yes. so it wasn't it was. that it was outside people uh, no, who were but pretending. it was a very small student organization. To be a student organization at Berkeley, you need two members. So. <laughs> 
very <laughs> clubbable group. <laughs> So let's talk about free speech and some of the differences. But I thought I would start by asking you about something that uh, I think many people know about, the University of Chicago principles on free speech, which I think were voted by the faculty of Chicago in 2014. Um, and it was to promote a lively and fearless freedom of debate, but also to protect that freedom when others attempt to restrict it. Um, so it's about free speech and individuals being able to have free speech, but it's also a position of institutional neutrality. And that's kind of fascinating. I think maybe 86 or 80 something institutions have signed on. So my question is, is a kind of large one. Um, first, what is that principle of institutional neutrality and free speech. Maybe you can explain a little bit about that, whether it's relevant to Berkeley, and whether you think it's either desirable or possible in this climate. It's really interesting. I don't think there's a yes or no answer to your question. I think for the most part, institutional neutrality is a good position for the leaders of universities to take. I don't think that someone in my position should be um, uh, uh, opining about every situation in the United States or internationally that occurs. Um, and the, the reasoning behind it, I think, is really interesting, that you don't want the leader of an institution to appear to be taking sides with one part of his or her community and not the other. In other words, in a very controversial issue, um, that uh, taking a, uh, making a statement about your opinion inevitably excludes some people, makes them feel less welcome, makes them feel like their views have um, of, of less value in the eyes of the institution. However, and this is where I depart from the Chicago principles, I think there are times when something happens that so strikes to the heart of the country. I think of the murders of George Floyd, for example, where not to speak out seems to me to suggest a lack of a moral compass. And so I don't think that, for, I, I believe that for the most part, institutional neutrality serves you well but there are some instances in which um, the, the situation itself, its urgency, its moral urgency, seems to demand a response. I would also make an exception for issues that are immediately relevant to higher education as yeah. opposed to situations in the world about which um, many people have opinions. Yeah, if something is mission related, if yes. it's deeply affecting one's own community. Um, I've also thought, what is your expertise to opine about? I mean, so it's, it's part of what you're, uh, of what you're saying. But, but it seems now that presidents are expected particularly presidents of colleges and universities, sometimes of cultural institutions, but I think it's even stronger in higher education. And so how do you, um, how do you assess, and when you speak, um, who are you, spe for whom are you speaking? Or do you, like if you make your statement, um, I th how I do you think about that, I think you have to that, be Karen? very clear in your message for whom you're speaking. So sometimes I speak about something that's happened on campus and really invoke the values of the institution, like mm -hmm. an um, act of bigotry, for example. Um, sometimes I speak in my own voice and I try to be very clear that it is my own voice. So when the Supreme Court struck down Roe versus Wade, I wrote a letter to the campus about Ro what Roe versus Wade had meant for me in my um, career as a woman and how I felt at this moment. But I tried to make it very clear that I was Monsieur. speaking for myself and from my own experience. I think people could 
um, argue with me and say I shouldn't have spoken up in that circumstance because it wasn't um, uh, for all members of our community a moral imperative, nor was it something that was um, directly, although I would say it was, was strongly related to higher education. But you had made it clear this was something you yes. felt intensely yes. to be, and, and that morally right. it was important right. um, to, to speak about. Right. Um, the situation obviously comes to mind of the new women presidents mm -hmm. who were asked about issues in front of uh, Congress and Elaine Stefanik. And you may have talked about this in other places, but I'd be interested in what you think about that. Um, and you were a new president at Berkeley, although not new to Berkeley and not new to the presidency when you were first encountered these issues. What do you think about um, what happened in, uh, in that circumstance and how they reacted to the questions that they were asked? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Uh, I, it, it was very troubling in many ways. First of all, it was very troubling to me that they asked three brand new women presidents. I wondered myself a lot, what if they had asked one of the more experienced presidents of the Ivy League or one of the male presidents of mm -hmm. the Ivy League, would the dynamics have been the same? I also felt that they mistook the nature of the occasion and they yeah. thought they were walking into a deposition mm -hmm. and were very well um, counseled about the legal um, aspects of the situation, but they needed to speak from the heart. And um, so I think they may have made a, 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 a strategic mistake in, in how they responded. But w when you're a more experienced president, you have many relationships, as you know. Yeah. And it's not that nobody at Berkeley has been upset at what's happening on campus in relationship to the um, Israel-Hamas war, but they tend to call me up um, rather than um, try to make their case in the public square without that conversation. So that's one of the advantages of being an experienced um, leader and another thing is you, you just you gain an experience in how to, how to handle um, certain situations, how to judge what kind of response is best. To go back to the discussion about the principles of free speech and its defense, how do you balance the tension between that and student safety or this, the safety on campus? I know there have been events at Berkeley that have been troubling. Um, in, in terms of that, what, what have you learned about it or thought about it, and how do, you, how do you think about that balance? I think of the conflict as more one between the protections that are guaranteed by the First Amendment for free speech. And I'm very much a John Stuart Mill libertarian in relationship to free speech, and less about student safety than I think about the protections guaranteed by Title VI and Title IX, that everyone has the right to a learning environment that is equal, equitable, in the experiences that it offers, in the opportunities that it offers. And that's a real tension, it's a tension of laws. One of the things that's been extraordinarily puzzling to me about the current situation is the sense of physical precarity that our students have. I've heard so many students from both sides tell me they don't feel physically safe on campus. The campus is a pretty safe place. I really don't think they're physically unsafe. But the um, world of social media even the world of casual social interaction doesn't feel safe to them. And one of the things that is so deeply painful and concerning 
about the current situation is that students on each side feel that the conflict is existential for mm -hmm. them, that the other side is denying them something essential to their identity. So I think that's the question more than physical safety. I think it's more a kind of emotional safety. Now I've said often that I would wish that um, students were growing more in resilience. I, I remember when I was a kid, I'm sure many of you in this audience remember the, the, you know, the kind of childhood sticks and stones can break my bones but names can never hurt me. Well, it, we're in a world now where people feel very strongly that names can hurt. And that, of course, is very much in conflict with the guarantees of free speech, which are, as you all know, really quite extreme. Unless you're saying something that poses the threat of immediate harm to another person, you can say it as abhorrent as it is. So as I've been thinking about free speech deeply for years now, but particularly in the last year, I've been thinking that free speech, yes, it's an absolute, but it's not sufficient. That what you have to think about is the impact your words are going to have on your community. So I often say to students, just because you have the right to say something doesn't mean it's a right to say. And so thinking about that impact on the community seems to me so important. One of the things our country has lost, and I feel so sad about this, is the capacity to have respectful disagreement with people whose views are very different from your own, what you think are terribly, terribly mistaken, wrong. But you can have civil conversation, even when you deeply disagree. Have there been events, though, this year um, I mean, I know the doors were taught, torn off mm -hmm. of the one, uh, one place where an, a former Israeli mm -hmm. um, military and an uh, Israeli lawyer was invited by pro-Israel Jewish students mm -hmm. and it didn't happen. I mean, is there a point where there is a threat to physical safety uh, or where the, when the language becomes something that does, uh, that's something you investigate, that's something that you take seriously. Yeah, well, the, uh, it, uh, the speaker who um, was unable to speak yeah. um, uh, came back a few weeks later, he was invited back, that was very important to me, and he spoke without incident. Now, nobody writes a, a newspaper story saying, yeah, that. speaker speaks without incident. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I do think that all views should be heard. I think that you, 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 you fight words with words, yeah. not words with shutting down speakers. So the, I think the UC Regents brought up the possibility that they would ban certain political speech on the websites mm -hmm. of departments, mm -hmm. or, uh, and mostly those were pro-Palestinian um, justice for Palestine mm -hmm. groups. I think they deferred. I, I didn't follow exactly what happened, but what, what do you It's think coming about? back to the regents at the next regents meeting in May. And what the regents feel is what they call the landing page, the home page for a department, the English department, for example, should be free of political statements. You can have them other places on the website, but not on the landing page, which they feel should be informational. I myself um, I don't, don't believe this is a wise policy yeah. because I think the line between political and uh, apolitical speech is not so easy to draw. So if the African American Studies Department at Berkeley, for example, says Black Lives Matter, is that a political statement? Yeah. Can they say that on their website? If the Women's Studies Department says we believe in gender equity, is that a political statement? Yeah. If, uh, uh, I and think who gets to say? I mean, I guess the regents have the power to do that. Well, the regents say the chancellors have to judge this. Yeah, okay. 
By the way, Carol told me she likes hard questions, so, um, so feel free, and, and I uh, feel free. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We could return to this, but I listened to an interview that you did, which was called Behind the Blue Blazer. <laughs> Carol is known. For, I knew she would wear a blue blazer, so I decided to wear orange just so that we wouldn't um, be twins. But you said something that I thought was quite funny and poignant. You said, if you want everybody to love you, get a dog. <laughs> <laughs> that hit home because my husband Peter and I got a puppy recently. <laughs> so I was thinking, and, and so my question to you is, what was your point about saying that, about about leadership. I mean, I was can't it remember. I can't remember the question I was responding to, but often people are really it, interested in the that, at the top, that, or? that uh, that aspect of um, your job in which people are saying nasty things yeah. both about you and to you, yeah. uh, and they often disagree with you, and you just have to not personalize it. It's just, it's so important to do these jobs to realize you will make decisions that will make people angry, that will make people very upset with you, and you cannot nurse those that sense of hurt and um, take it home with you every night or you will be a very unhappy person. <laughs> And when I go home and the puppy is there, it's like, yes. no, other, <laughs> it's like no other feeling. But it, 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 it is true um, that it's both personalized. And I think that if you make decisions thinking about that completely, you can't be effective, as effective. That's, that's in exactly right. Really yeah, trying to make decisions. Um, let me talk about something, a, a decision and a kind of third rail for presidents, which is uh, university sports. <laughs> yeah. um, and ask you, uh, we're in Pasadena and two local universities uh, and many alums in the audience I know, UCLA and USC, decided to leave um, the Pac-12 and go to the Big Ten, leaving Berkeley and Stanford uh, in the association and uh, leaving them behind. I, I know, I think, what happened after that, but what was your reasoning about that and how did you think about that and uh, what transpired? Well, I, I, first I should say that the landscape in college ath uh, athletics currently is more volatile than I've ever seen it. Uh, so many things, it's not just conference realignment, it's uh, athletes possibly becoming employees. It's the um, sharing of revenues with athletes. It's, um, it's uh, the way in which football is really the piper and is playing the tune football and its alliance with um, broadcast media. And I, I believe within five years, there's gonna be a dramatically different landscape in, um, in college sports. I feel extremely sad that the Pac-12 um, ended as a conference. Um, when I tell the story, which I'll spare this audience, of the way in which the Pac-12 um, collapsed, I said within uh, the course of about two weeks, Kumbaya turned into Lord of the Flies. It was really a, a very, very difficult, but it was every school thinking, this landscape is collapsing around me and I've got to find a place in a Power Five conference. And so That's everybody what, voted, leaving um, the Pac-12 became the Pac-2. <laughs> right. And so Berkeley joined the AC ACC. Joined it's now the, um, uh, the, the All Coast Conference. <laughs> ah. <laughs> the A migrated, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I see. Uh, um, but, but still the athletes in non-revenue generating sports 
what? The, your athletes will travel to Rutgers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's well. Rutgers is part of the Big oh, Ten. Big Ten. I mean, but, geography yeah, but the, doesn't. But make the any, East Coast. Yeah, but, the East but Coast. to the East yeah. Coast, that's right. And I, I, it's fewer of our sports are affected than one might think. I mean, it won't surprise you that the ACC doesn't have beach volleyball, for example, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> doesn't have um, crew. And uh, yeah, so there's some sports that are really West Coast sports and will stay here. Other sports like field hockey traveled east anyway. But nonetheless, yes, our athletes are going to be traveling a lot more. They said they really wanted to be in a Power Five conference. Um, and um, But what is, I, I, I think, so sad about this situation is that these other sports are really not much like football, and yet they're being dragged along with the football model. And my prediction is that football is going to split off and be its own organization within five years. Really? And then perhaps we can go back to a more rational situation with the other sports. Um, in your... <laughs> in the Blue Blazer, behind the Blue Blazer interview, you also said that some of the changes you came to make or thought you wanted to make took longer than you yes. thought they would. What were some of the obstacles? Um, I, uh, what are some of the examples? One of the most important obstacles is the pandemic. So yeah. that the pandemic really made, you know, within two weeks, we all became remote. And, um, and we were so focused on getting our institutions through the pandemic that some of the changes we were trying to make were harder, uh, were harder to make. Um, and it had its, of course, it own set of budget challenges. And yeah. so that was in part, in part, changes in academic institutions are not, I mean, let's say, Academic institutions don't have a reputation for speed and efficiency in decision making. <laughs> <laughs> it always takes longer because I, I, academic <laughs> institutions generally are fairly flat institutions, complexly organized, have many stakeholders. People often think being the um, head of a university like Berkeley is like being a CEO. I say, no way. It's much more like being the mayor of a small city in which you, everybody feels like I, they have an ownership stake, and you have to bring enough of them along with whatever change you're trying to make so that the change gets rooted, otherwise it doesn't. What about um, the People's Park? Oh, People's Park. Um, <laughs> At People's Park, I came to Berkeley in 1970, and the People's Park was a very different place in 1970. Yeah. It really was a People's Park that was in the middle of the hippie revolution, and there were grass and flowers and trees and people having doing really wonderful things, but it had become a, a kind of place where um, uh, uh, drugs were dealt, several different drug rings, um, uh, the, yeah. lots of crime, lots of injuries and death, and, um, and so I, I felt the park had to change for the south side of campus to change. And one of the advantages of this being a, a kind of, um, I'm not looking for another job, a job, um, <laughs> that, um, that I, I could not care about the political cost of something and do what I thought was right. And uh, we tried to close the park once, it didn't work, and we, the second time it worked. And I feel confident that we will build in the park this time around. And so your goal of, un of is it undergraduate housing? Or is it's, it, um, it's what, what it's that going to be on the park are three things. First, undergraduate housing, about 1,000 beds, apartment style. And then we're building um, a, a supportive, permanent housing for the homeless, about 125 apartments, and then, um, and then a park. So those three things it will take up the site. And it seemed like the press that you got, although there were uh, protests about it, were, were much, it was much calmer and more accepting at this point. I think, of the goals of the university. I, I, th I, I think that's everything. right. I think what happened is the People's Park activists lost the narrative. 
Mm-hmm. And now everybody knows that the narrative is about we need more housing. And so arguing that this park should be a homeless encampment in which people were pretty much free to do what they wanted was a story that had much less traction. Yeah, than it and once you shifted did. the narrative, I think. Well, I didn't do it by myself. Yeah. If you would pass your um, cards and begin to do that, so we'll do that. I have a couple more questions, and then I want to uh, give time to yours, so we'll, we'll begin collecting them. So recently um, at the Huntington, I did an interview on Founders Day with a colleague who was also the head of um, a cultural organization, Natural History Museum. And a question came from the audience to me about leadership. And it was, how did my work as a scholar and teacher of James Joyce help me in, in, in the leadership positions I had? And I think I said, I talked about James Joyce's Dubliners and the fact that much of what was important was never said but was between the lines. It's a very tight-lipped, those stories. Or that Ulysses, a book I love, gave you a glimpse into the interior life of others in a way that almost nothing else could, both what gives people joy and what gives them pain. And that those were all lessons, that lens and an interest in language was a very important tool and aspect of dealing with people in any position, but in a leadership position. So I'm going to ask you the same thing about your work as a scholar of Victorian literature, I think specializing in poetry, which you are delighted to see today. But, you know, what is studying George Eliot's Middlemarch or Great Expectations or a Browning poem? Um, how does that, how is that continuous with the way that you see your career and what has it given you? Yeah, that's a question I'm often asked, as I'm sure you're often asked. And to me, I mean, the Victorian novel, they're these big baggy monsters and what they're about (laughs) fundamentally are the relationship of multiple individuals to society. And that's the work that we do. We're in the business of these very complex communities in which people as individuals are connected to those communities and connected to the society beyond the community of our individual institutions. You learn empathy from literature. You learn a sensitivity to language from literature. And you learn about narrative and storytelling from literature. And sometimes I think of my job as storyteller in chief. So (laughs) much of being the head of an institution is Mm. telling stories. I mean, you know that. You tell the story of the Huntington. I tell the story of Berkeley. I told the story of Smith. And that's one of the things literature teaches you. So I actually think English literature is a great preparation for leadership. (laughs) (laughs) I'll talk for that. How, so Berkeley had one of the best, if not the best English departments in the country for many years. How is it doing now? I, it's doing wonderfully, although Good. that's a world I left a long time ago, but the, it's but doing the depo- really wonderfully. I mean, the, and, may, and students taking oh, yeah. classes. As a matter of fact, great. there was an article in the New Yorker called The Death of the English Major. I read it. But there was a, this sentence in parentheses in the middle of one of these very long New Yorker articles, and which said, Berkeley is an exception to this trend. And, um, oh, really? and Berkeley, in fact, the I, English major is okay. very healthy. I read that article and missed that parenthesis. <laughs> I was looking for it. (laughs) So my last question to you, and thank you, Raylene, great, um, is if your retirement takes this time, and and takes this time, and you you say it will, what will you do? Well, I'll spend more time with my children, my grandchildren, I'll travel more, I'll read more, I'll write, I'll spend more time on the not-for-profit boards that I'm a member of, and I will um, really uh, just um, enjoy life at less of a furious pace than I currently have. Okay. Okay, so now questions from the audience. What's your biggest concern about the next generation of students? 
Oh, that's such an interesting question. Uh, I mean, I have two concerns, but they're connected. One is that I think we're still experiencing the hangover, is the way I describe it, of the pandemic. That students have forgotten, or perhaps didn't learn, at the point they would have learned how to be in community. So they've lost some of their wow. social skills, and they feel a level of anxiety and depression that really worries me, and they live too much on their screens and in social media and less in company with others. And I think we're seeing that in the current conflicts on campus where, where it's so hard to bring students together to actually talk with each other as painful as it might be. Hmm. Um, next question, with private college tuition now approaching $100,000 all in, I'm not surprised at this question, so it's a good one, and gainful employment available only in tech and data-driven jobs, can students really afford to explore the arts and humanities? And this comes from a Smith College graduate from 93. <laughs> Well, I think students are really depriving themselves of an incredibly important part of their education if they don't explore the arts and humanities. There's a wonderful essay written by a chemist named Thomas Cech, uh, which is about liberal arts education. And he does a study of scientific leaders. This was back in you know, a little bit after the year 2000 and finds that many of them went to liberal arts colleges. And he believes that studying multiple disciplines makes you, he, he argues that the reason to study the arts and humanities is not that you're a cultured person and you like poetry and you go to the opera, but rather it makes you a better scientist because you're used to changing your frame of reference. Mm -hmm. And I feel so sad for our students who think all they have to do is load up in computer science and data science and economics classes and don't learn things about history, things about the social sciences, things about the arts, things about the humanities. They're going to help them understand the world in which we live and the places their careers are gonna take them. So I think it's not, I think they can't afford not to study the arts and humanities in terms of how well their educations are going to serve them through many changes of occupation and the many turns that life takes. I felt that very much as a college president and as an English major and, yeah. and teacher. Um, how much do you think parents sometimes exert pressure on that. I remember as Dean of Humanities at UC Irvine, we had many biology students um, or engineering students who would sneak take literature courses. Yeah. Because they, it, cause it gave them, I mean, it's kind of in keeping with what you're saying. It, it felt like they, very important and they wanted to do it and they loved it, but they didn't advertise it particularly to their parents because it was not going to lead to, you know, what are you going to do with an English major? What are you going to do with a history major? I feel like I have answers to that. But parent, I mean, part of it is um, parents allowing that or supporting. That. I, 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 that's certainly a problem at Berkeley, too. There's enormous parent, parental pressure yeah. to go into the majors that parents assume are going to lead to um, lucrative careers. What I often do when I speak to audiences is talk about all the people I know, I'm sure you know them too, who were enormously successful people that um, I, were all kinds of majors. And um, I always tell students, major yeah. for love. I mean, it's, it, it, it's so important. And certainly take classes for love. Yeah, I think so too. As one of the few women presidents in higher ed, um, actually, I'm not sure that there are only a few. Yeah, women there are presidents. more and more. Um, 
How do you feel about the opinion that women faculty help most of the academic housework over male faculty? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. And I, I, I can only speak from my Berkeley experience, but it doesn't seem to me true to my Berkeley experience. I, I, I think that um, the um, women faculty are incredible leaders across the institution, um, and I don't think that they're relegated to just kind of housework at all. Everybody has a service obligation, and I, I, you're judged by it when you come up for your merit increase, and, um, and I, I feel it's fairly well shared. So I'm, 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 I'm not sure I agree with by that. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the most joyful moments of your time as Berkeley's chancellor? Oh, that's a wonderful question. I mean, what I love is just meeting, meeting the students, meeting the alums, meeting the faculty. If you're an English professor, you, you live a fairly siloed world. And I am so, I feel so fortunate, I'm sure you feel the same way. I've met people I never would have met. Alumni with incredible lives, faculty across the campus who do amazing research, students who, you know, every year they come in with such vision, such ambition, so many ideas. So it's really the people that are the, 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 the joyous parts of my job, as well as some of the most irritating. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you won't be sorry to, I mean, you won't miss the most challenging, difficult things that have happened. I mean, this has been a tough year. Yeah, it's been a very tough year, and no, I, I, I won't, although I often say I like hard problems, I enjoy thinking <laughs> about them. But, um, but some of the, the problems are, I mean, like the current crisis in the Middle East, is nothing you can do as a chancellor or as a president is gonna make any difference whatsoever in the Middle East. Yeah. And um, so that's one of the, I mean, those are, uh, uh, there's some extraordinarily difficult issues. And this goes a little bit, you, you mentioned about r real changes in sports, in university and college sports that you see coming. This is a more general question. What do you see as the most significant changes on the horizon for higher ed? Oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I, I think that the, um, one of the uh, silver linings of the pandemic that doesn't have very many of them has really jerked um, faculty into the digital age. And I mm. see the increasing power of, um, of uh, digital, digital resources and capabilities for teaching and for research and for collaboration across long distances, that being an incredible change. Um, I think that, um, speaking for a public university, the um, budget model has completely changed in which we are um, less dependent on public funding than we once were, trying to multiply and diversify sources of funding. Um, the university is becoming much more entrepreneurial than it once was. Well, your successor was announced today, who's the That's business right. school, was the business school dean at Berkeley and is the head of entrepreneurship. And That's so, right. Uh, so there, he will have his work cut out for him yeah. uh, with that, but it uh, seems but like But I think that one choice. of the really interesting, I think this isn't quite what you were asking, but it's, it's um, relevant to the subject, I never thought I would see a time when higher education was a leading issue in the political discourse yeah. in our country. And I think there are two reasons for it. One is cost. I'm sure many of you saw the headline a few days ago in the business section of the New York Times, Vanderbilt over $100,000 a year, and everybody just quails, even though a, a lot of students don't pay that, it still is overwhelming 
People think higher education is just too expensive. I agree, it's just too expensive. But the other thing is I think there's a debate that's going on in our country right now about who gets to be first in line. And you see it in the debate about elite higher education, the value of the Ivies. And you see it in the debate about affirmative action. And so you have this good in our country, um, access to a university education, that people think, even with their saying, oh, you don't need to go to college anymore, application numbers don't seem to suggest that. They keep going up and up and up. So people seem to recognize it as a value, and yet such a small percentage of students get accepted. And so you have this thing that's perceived as a good, that seems out of reach financially, that seems out of reach competitively, that raises questions of who deserves to get in. And I mm -hmm. think that question of who gets to be first in line, who gets this privilege, is one of the most important questions that higher education has to face. Do you also feel that the, or I never anticipated that it would, um, the, the value, not the, not the price, but the value of a higher education would be under such contestation? I mean, yeah. Questions of access, questions of how much it costs, but the real huge skepticism about the academy about higher education um, in so much of the political discourse it just it makes it very, very difficult to um, really, it, one has to put forward that narrative and, and make a justification and the rising numbers of applications suggest that there are students who keep applying, but there's such a skepticism it's really, really interesting. Ed. I mean, this so much goes against the grain for a lot of people in competitive institutions. We're so happy to talk about our excellence. And I think we have to talk a lot more about access than mm -hmm. excellence and figure out ways of expanding access. I think that the discussion about lack of value of, a higher, of higher education has more to do with that path isn't for the likes of me. And so I need to devalue it. What do you do when something's closed to you? You devalue it. And I, I, I see what's happening to the workplace, and people do need higher education, but we have to figure out a way to make it more available and to talk less about his elitism and more about access. One final hard question, but not hard in the way that you might think this is a, a tough <laughs> question. What's something you used to firmly believe about which you since changed your mind? Oh, wow. I'm asking you this because I'm looking at it and I'm not exactly sure what I would say. That's a really, it's a very, it really seems... interesting question. I think it actually has to do with free speech. I used to think free speech was an absolute, mm -hmm. and it was an absolute because in the marketplace of ideas, the truth would always win out. I no longer believe in the marketplace of ideas. And I no longer believe the truth will win out. I think we all live in such media silos that there is no such thing anymore as the marketplace of ideas. I still think free speech is really important, but I no longer think the reason I thought it was important is true. Carol, Chris, thank you, thank you. so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you, everybody, for being here. This is the last Why It Matters program of the year, but please stay tuned for what we'll do next year. And as always, it's great to see so many of you here. 
the programs at the Huntington. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.